I refer to this, you know, monetary systems and macro policies for a steady state economy. I often just say monetary and fiscal policy for a steady state economy. And really, one way to think about it is I'm actually proposing a merger of monetary and fiscal policy just to come up with a fiscal policy that does both. Um, and I, you know, as I was saying, I'm just trying to do this in 15 minutes. Um, so there are a lot of super complex ideas here, and a 15 minute presentation of that will obviously be a bit brief. Um, and just, I think that we have, you know, some of these polls are pretty radical. Um, but uh, more and more, I think they're becoming feasible. And I just like this quote, Milton Friedman, one of my favorite economists, um, says, you know, this, people have probably seen that quote, but only crisis actual perceived produces real change. And when that crisis occurs, we've got to have those ideas laying around ready to be used. Um, and so that's what I see as our position right now here at the GUN. I actually think that a lot of our ideas that we're developing now are those that people will be, you know, desperately grabbing for in the uh, coming years. So to begin with, to begin with, you know, before you can design any kind of policy, you've got to figure out what your policy goals are. What do you want to achieve? And what we clearly, in my mind, you know, what we clearly want to achieve is this idea of, you know, ecological economics. So ecological sustainability, which really is a steady state throughput. The rate at which we extract raw materials from nature, convert them into economic uh, benefits and services, and spew them back as waste into nature um, has to, uh, cannot be increasing on a finite planet, and I would actually argue it has to be dramatically lower than it currently is today. Dramatically lower for CO2 emissions, at least an 80% reduction, probably quite a bit more. So we want to see how we can achieve that with a monetary and fiscal policy. And then just distribution. So first of all, the wealth and assets we create together as a society should belong to all of us. And I'm actually, I believe that monetary systems, money, the fact that we, it, you know, it's our mutual faith and trust in each other that allows money to work. So I think any value created by money should belong to society as a whole, but also value created by nature. And it has to be not only this generation, it has to be shared between generations. So we really need to think about how we do these to manage for future generations as well. You know, people deserve a fair return to their labor and assets once their assets are justly acquired. Um, and I actually believe equity is an end in itself. And I'll explain that a little bit better just with a simple graph. I don't have much time, but I'll show that in a second. And then we want efficient allocation. We want to use resources efficiently, which I'm looking at as kind of a maximization of sustainable welfare. When economists talk about efficiency, they mean one very specific thing. They mean maximizing monetary value, in which case it's far more efficient to give food to an overfed American than to a malnourished African because I'm willing to pay more for it, and therefore that maximizes monetary value. I don't buy into that definition of efficiency at all. Um, so... Oh, so, and here's why I was talking about equities and end in itself. This is a great book. I strongly recommend to anybody who hasn't read it. It's uh, The Spirit Level by Wilson and Pickett. And what they've done is they've looked at a whole bunch of indicators of uh, social ills and physical ills, so health and social health. And what they find, you know, you can see these things. It's life expectancy, and mortality, homicides, obesity, uh, drug addiction, social mobility, all sorts of these things. And what they've done is they've looked at how countries fare on these things according to income inequality. So here's an index of those indicators, and here are the OECD countries, or uh, uh, quite a few of them, uh, ranked by income inequality. And as you see, is I mean, a very tight correlation. As we get less and less equal countries, we get more and more social ills. You can do that same thing across the U.S. states. So I actually believe that we uh, evolve in conditions of relative egalitarianism and fairness, and we suffer from inequity. And this is, um, and it's the wealthy actually do better off, or worse off, in um, unequal countries. Um, and, uh, and this is not relative, this is not anything to do with your absolute wealth. So the USA is one of the richest countries, um, and then you have, uh, I'm not sure what they have in the way of poorer countries, but other, other of the richest countries are way down here. So you're better off being equal and um, not that rich than you are being just rich. So our current system, how does the current monetary system work? So people understand this concept of seniorage, which is the difference between the value of a currency and what it costs you to print it. So when the government prints a $100 bill, it probably costs 20 cents, I have no idea. Actually, they get to spend it into existence, get that whole $100. But most money these days, there's about, um, we currently have different ways to look at it, but there seems to be about $50 trillion out there in money, and I'll explain that in a minute. Um, less than a uh, um, I think it's about 787 billion is, is that right? Yeah, in, uh, in actual currency. So a very small part is actual currency. The U.S. gets 
seniority on that actual currency, but the rest of that money is loaned into existence by banks. So when I go to that bank and I take out a mortgage for my pay for my house, most people think I'm borrowing money somebody else has deposited. That's absolutely not the case. The money, the bank has the right to print me a check on money that does not previously exist and loan it to me. So the seniority in this case is um, the I have to, you know, they, they get that in a way to begin with. I get the value of that uh, check for the cost, you know, on those the cost of them putting it. When I, so the money is loaned into existence when they loan it to me. It's paid back. It's destroyed actually when I pay that loan back. So money is loaned into existence. It's destroyed when I pay it back. But the rate of flow of loans, when it um, exceeds the rate of paying back of loans, your pool of money expands. So debt in society is pretty much a measure of how much money is out there. There's a couple. There's some. Uh, Disagreement whether some people talk about fractional reserve that banks have to hold about 10% of uh, their loans on hand, which one way of looking at it allows banks to loan about 10 times as much money as they have. But in reality, if somebody approaches a bank and says, I want to borrow money, the bank thinks they're a good credit risk, the bank will loan them that money, and if they don't have enough reserves, they'll just go to the Federal Reserve and borrow money at the end of the day to make sure they have enough reserves. And right now, the interest rate at which they borrow is essentially zero, lower than inflation. They're borrowing at negative interest rates. So they can essentially create money hand over fist. As long as there's demand for money, they will create it. Um, so there really is no limit on it in the current system. So monetary policy, the idea we manipulate the money supply and the interest rates, and we make money more freely available with interest rates lower, which leads firms to invest and leads consumers to buy. Um, it only affects market goods, though. A firm, if you're borrowing money at interest, you can only invest it in something that pays a, a return, which has to be a market good, something that can make a profit. No incentive to invest in any public goods or anything else. Um, that, so um, it's a very blunt instrument, not very well tuned. We've been giving huge amounts of money right now, um, really low interest rates and uh, making a lot of money available. And the banks still aren't loaning it into existence. They're actually just sitting on it. Um, and this is the problem with velocity. If we have banks, if you have a banks rapidly loaning billions of dollars and it's being paid back and being loaned again and being paid back, the same bill can circ you know, the same money circulates many, many times. So it's money times velocity. And what we have now is banks sitting on trillions of dollars, a velocity of zero for that money. So it doesn't act like it's part of our money supply. Um, well, actually, I thought they were speculating in Asia. Well, they are. They are speculating in Korea and Brazil and India. So. Um, and they're actually, yeah, they're allowed to borrow money from the Fed and um, use that themselves. They're allowed to borrow an investment. But, um, so fiscal policy, the basic idea right now is that taxes finance government expenditure. You put taxes on people and uh, government can use it to expend it. When the, when the government does, um, you know, uh, deficit spending, it just means the taxes will be higher in the future. So it's always, you know, it's always taxes that back up fiscal policy. We can borrow now and tax later. Um, the interesting thing though is quantitative easing, what Ben Bernanke's been doing, is he has been selling um, dollars to the U.S. government in exchange for treasury notes. So the U.S. government has to pay the treasury note, the, the, the Fed, interest on that, but 96% of the profits of the Fed go back to the U.S. government. So basically, the government is just printing and spending, because they're doing it through this slightly roundabout way, but um, they're not borrowing to spend it, they're just printing, because you know they have to pay back they have to pay back later, but then they get all the interest payments back from the Fed. So, um, I have a question about that. Yeah. Because <clears throat> that sounds like the, the government is printing money it is. with no interest. But they have to pay all the expenses of the, of the Federal Reserve. And so, so that's subtracted from the yes, yes. cost. So, they're, so they, there's a right. huge amount of expenses that come out of that. Yeah. Right? So they get back 96% of the profits from the Fed, but that's after that's paying, paying all the costs and everything else. The Fed, right? And the, uh, yeah, so. Um, so it's, it's not quite, but it's, it's a little it's, deceptive. I it's think. a little deceptive, but it's the same general idea. Um, so take a look at the track record for the current system. And again, as I want to talk about this in the, the goals we talked about sustainability, justice, um, efficiency. So, you know, banks loan capital. When I took that $100,000 out to buy my house, the bank loaned me the capital that created that much money, I have to pay them back ultimately probably $250,000. They loaned me the capital, they didn't loan me the interest. Somewhere I have to get that interest. Unless the economy is growing in size, it can be incredibly challenging to get that interest. Some people are gonna, you know, some businesses are gonna go under, some people are gonna go bankrupt, unless the economy is growing in size. Um, 
to generate that interest, which means continuous growth is required. I mean, you have to have a growing economy. Or you can have defaults. It's growing economy or default, collapse of, uh, you know, you don't pay the debt. And I believe this is um, something, you know, uh, is, is Saudi and a lot of other people have said, you know, exponential growth forever is impossible. And I would argue that's where jubilees came from, that every 50 years you just eliminate debt. You just have that default because you can't have the exponential growth that's physically impossible. So um, interest rates, I would also argue, when you have to pay money back with interest, I have a forest here that could, pr uh, you know, s provide this flow of services every day forever, but I don't control the rate at which it provides that flow of services. I do control the rate at which I convert that forest into raw materials, and the timber, and I can do that tomorrow and pay back my interest. If you're in the Brazilian Amazon right now, if you are lucky and you got good credit and everything, you go to the bank, you can get a, a, a loan at 40% interest per year. Um, and you cannot, you know, no ecosystem provides services at a rate that could help you, even if you can market those services, which you typically can't. You can't um, get enough to pay it back. So when those, farm, when those uh, landowners, they chop down all, or sawmill owners, they'll chop down all the forests, then they can pay back their loan. So those interest rates really do favor conversion of natural capital for marketable raw materials over conservation. Um, in terms of the current system, the track record for justice, so interest payments flow from the borrowers um, to the financial sector and lenders. And I have old data for this that shows the bottom 80% of the economy essentially hemorrhages interest payments to the top 10%. So it's a huge transfer of wealth. Um, and here you can just see this is, a, you know, um, this is the total debt of our, of our society as a share of GNP. And here are financial sector profits. And you see when the debt started to skyrocket, financial sector profits start to skyrocket. So what you see here is actually up to about 350% of GNP right now is what our, our, our debt is, so it's $50 trillion. If you assume we're paying an average of 6% interest on that, then that's $3 trillion. That's like you know uh, one-fifth of our GNP being transferred every year to the financial sector. Um, this just shows the uh, share of total GNP from financial services and manufacturing. Um, you know, here's financial services, here's manufacturing. So manufacturing, you're producing real physical goods and services. Uh, financial sector, you're using, you're, you're, you know, it's just currency, you're not actually, you know, I, you, theoretically you're facilitating production, but um, I think we're shifting from real production to uh, speculation. Um, this is just shows the breakdown of current, of, of, uh, of debt. So everybody's terrified about our federal government debt. This is total U.S. debt. Here's federal government debt, about uh, 14 trillion or so. We're up there at about, um, you know, over 50 trillion. And it's, um, you know, the financial sector debt. That's what's really taken off. Uh, Non-financial business debt also, um, and then households. And uh, but so you know, we're in a panic over this, and I think that's a bit of a misplaced panic. Um, so I, I, I'm sorry, I'm going too fast. But it's only you know 15 minutes. I would also another issue with uh, another issue with our current system of justice is the erosion of democracy. And I really do believe what uh, Brandeis said that you know we can have a democratic society where we can have a concentration of wealth in the hands of the few. We can't have both. And even Simonson, you know, former uh, economist for the IMF, very free market kind of guy, he's saying that the uh, um, the financial sector has so much control over government right now that we can't pass any laws to rein them in. They've just got too large a share of GNP, and, are, you know, and, and Obama's made it very explicit that uh, he is pursuing the financial sector for campaign donations. And you know, he, um, I don't think that's uh, you know, uh, no strings attached. So our current system for efficiency, how efficient is our current system? Well, a lot of what happened in this recent um, bubble uh, you know, the stock prices went down in 2001, so the rich folks were wondering what to do with their money. And they take it out of stocks because it's paying very low returns, and they start putting it into land. And when you have more and more people putting it into land, um, the price of land starts to go up. So we learn in all economics classes the law of demand. It's not just a theory, it's a law that when price goes up, uh, demand goes down. But well, actually in a speculative market, when price goes up, demand goes up. So we see in speculation, you know, the price goes up, your demand goes up, you have, you have the value of your assets goes up, which allows you to borrow more money because now you have more collateral to invest in more assets, and you get this huge leveraging. You're borrowing huge amounts of money 
to invest in these speculative properties, which drives up the price of the properties faster and faster and faster, and that's a positive feedback loop. It's not a negative feedback loop going to equilibrium, but a positive feedback loop that cannot persist in any natural system and inevitably must collapse. And then we get the downside of the bubble. So what happens, though, is our banking system loans money into existence hand over fist when the economy is booming. Firms want to invest. Speculators want to invest. The, the um, banks believe that because of the growing value of their assets, they will always be paid back. They loan money hand over fist, creating huge amounts of money, stimulating the economic boom. And then when the crash comes, the banks suddenly realize that you know, people don't have the collateral, that they're overextended, and they, bar they, they get paid back as fast as possible. So they destroy the money supply. So why did we have to come in um, in the latest crisis and issue huge, you know, try to get the government to put out a huge amount of money with debt? Um, money in our system is based on debt. When the um, people are trying to deleverage, get rid of their debt, our money supply goes away, and you need the government to step in. But we've designed a system that exacerbates bubbles and exacerbates crashes. And also, in terms of efficiency, a lot of studies show that public goods, these things that provide no, re um, no financial returns um, to the individual, but they provide returns to society as a whole, they have phenomenally higher rates of return than a lot of investments in the private sector. So just the one that I've been looking at lately is in agriculture. The average rate of return on public good investments in agriculture is like 65%. You know, some studies show 45, some show 80. Just massive things you can't get. And yet, we're, I would argue, dramatically under-investing in public goods and dramatically over-investing in market goods, and that's highly inefficient. So, um, so how do we deal with this? How do we fix this issue? I would actually argue that we totally want to rethink monetary policy. And here's, I'm lumping together monetary systems and monetary policy. I think we have to take away the rights of banks to create or destroy money. This means that banks would have what they call 100% fractional reserve banking. If you deposit money into the bank in a savings account and you agree I'm going to leave it there for six months, the bank can loan that money for six months. If you leave it there for five years, they can loan it for five years. They can only loan time deposits. I forego the use of that money um, and, uh, and for, for, for uh, current consumption in exchange for la larger future consumption, so I'll get some interest on it. But if somebody spends it, they can only spend it when I'm not spending it. So it's, uh, it's not increasing the money supply. If I have money in a checking account, 100% of it has to stay there. I would probably pay for the service of checking. Banks would not pay us interest. We would pay banks for protecting our money totally change the system. We have a unique opportunity to do this because banks are trying to accumulate their assets. They're not loaning money anyway. So we could gradually ratchet up their fractional reserve, gradually reduce their uh, legal ability to loan money into existence. They're not using it right now anyway. If we take it away from them, um, they wouldn't even notice, and we could start ratcheting it up in that direction. Um, instead, we move to a system. <laughs> I haven't had any calls from the Republican National Convention that, that, that's you know, run for office yet. Um, but, so the government instead would actually take back the rights. So the government would print and spend money into existence. So this, um, the government, uh, just to look at it, you know, last year we printed $1.6 trillion in interest-bearing bonds. We have to pay back much more than $1.6 trillion. People say they can't trust the government to print and spend money, but we can trust them to print and spend bonds where we get less bank, you know, we have to pay back more than we borrowed. And so I don't quite understand that distinction. But the government, and, and people will take money printed by the government because you have to pay taxes. And I'll get back to that in a second. So government could also print and loan. It could loan money into existence, creating the money by loaning it. When the loan is paid back, ideally interest-free because it's invested in sectors that are critical to our economy and our welfare. When the loan is paid back, it's destroyed. So money goes into existence and is destroyed. Money goes into existence and is destroyed again by taxes. When you tax it back, it's equivalent to destroying the money. So Abraham, this is not like radical ideas. Abraham Lincoln did this to finance um, the Civil War. They wanted to loan him money at 30%. He said, no way, I'm going to print and spend it into existence and finance this war without breaking the country financially. And as I said, the quantitative easing too is very similar. Um, so the idea here, essentially now, the government spent money into existence to address its priorities, to invest in public goods, to invest in these things, and that creates money. So the fiscal policy of expenditure has now become your monetary policy of creating the money supply to lubricate the economy. So it gives the government, obviously, much more leverage, but it merges the two policies. 
Um, fiscal policy, though, is a bit more detailed. Fiscal policy is taxation and expenditures. The government, so when the, when the Fed, when we're trying to lower interest rates to stimulate the economy, the idea is firms, private sector firms, will invest and create more market goods because you need to be able to pay back. Um, when the government does it, the government can target its money anywhere it wants, not just on market goods. It can explicitly spend that money to address unemployment, misery, poverty. It can provide public goods. It can restore natural capital. It can rebuild our infrastructure. It can fund education. It can do a whole array of things that I would argue at the margin now, because we've been neglecting them for so long, have much higher returns. Um, uh, and I'm almost done here because I really think going a little lower. Um, taxation is another issue. I think we should really use, you know, we should tax unearned income, which is rent. We should tax natural resource extraction, waste emissions. All of these things will have dramatic impacts on sustainability. I also think we need dramatic income tax increases that asymptotically approach 100% at the margin. And we've been phrasing this wrong. We've been talking about, well, what's a fair income tax? You know, is it fair to take away 37%? Is it fair to take away 40% of what people earn? I think in instead of asking that, we say, what's a fair amount to leave somebody with? You know, how much does somebody actually need to meet their wildest consumption fantasies with the argument that if you accumulate wealth beyond your wildest consumption fantasies, it's probably translating into political power, and you're intruding on the one person, one vote, which we think is kind of sacred democracy. So how much is enough? So if you think that leaving somebody with a million dollars a week, is that going to be enough? A million dollars a week implies a marginal tax bracket of 90, actually, implies a total tax of 99% Paulson made $5 billion each of the last three years, I believe. So if you think $5 million a year is enough, we need a 99.9% .9 tax rate. Or if you think a $1 million a year is enough, that translates into a 99.98% .98 tax bracket, which is basically what I believe is our tax brackets have asymptotically approached 100%. And this figure I need to update. All this shows is this is the highest marginal tax bracket, and this is the share of wealth owned by the top one-tenth of 1%. So low tax brackets, extreme accumulation of wealth, high tax brackets, more distribution of wealth. It goes back and forth. This, it, it fails up here, and this is because I don't include capital gains. This is the year when we uh, knock capital gains taxes from 30% to 15%. So a huge decrease in taxes, which you saw is a huge increase in accumulation of wealth. So, um, so again, if you believe in equality, I think 99% tax brackets would be worthwhile if we just flush the money down the toilet afterwards for the rich folks because we get greater equality, greater, uh, less social ills, less uh, better health outcomes. Um, and, uh, um, but uh, you know, ideally we could spend it to address real problems too. So I think we've got to really rethink taxation. I don't think the government needs taxation for revenue. The government can spend money into existence as it likes. What taxation does, people will accept dollars if they know by law they have to pay taxes in those dollars or go to jail. So you're forced. So, so we used to have gold-backed currency. Now we need tax-backed currency because you have to pay taxes. You will accept the fiat currency by the government. Um, and it's now it's a policy tool. We use it to reduce resource use by taxing activities we don't want. We use it to give the dollar value just like we used to use gold. We use it to achieve a desirable income distribution. We use it to adjust... Um, you know, essentially to, to reduce public, uh, private sector spending, to increase public sector spending. Um, and we can use it to manipulate the money supply. If we wanted a, a decreasing, an economy that decreases in size over time, we want less money every year. We want taxation actually to exceed expenditures. But when we need to spend to stimulate the economy to employ people, we can do that. So, um, so this kind of, um, I tried to, it wasn't quite 15 minutes, but I don't want to go on and on. So uh, those are some of the ideas, some of the things I think we should think about and the way we should be envisioned. Taxes are not about raising revenue. You don't need, that's not even on there. Tax, you know, the current view of taxes to raise revenue, you don't even think it has to be there at all. So those are some of my ideas for how we could, um, uh, you know, reform our economy and, you know, and uh, reduce the money supply as our economy grows smaller. Other economists say, well, taxation reduces economic growth, to which I say, great. And the final word on that is Gregory Mankiw had an article. He was George Bush's economic advisor. And he had an article in the New York Times saying, if you tax me more, I'll work less. And I was thinking, damn it, why don't we have taxes during the Bush administration? Because, you know, I couldn't think of anything better than having Mankiw work less. Um, but, so anyway, for now for uh, discussions and everything. Uh, yeah. Uh, thanks for doing this, and just know that I'm a babe in the woods when it comes to this, but let me ask this, this question for a start. 
you say that taxes destroy money. But isn't another view of a tax just to redirect spending? So a tax destroys money if you tax it and don't spend it. Right. It recirculates money if you tax it and spend it. Right. But I'm arguing that as we move toward a steady state economy, we've got to, you know, in an ever-growing economy, you need more and more money to chase more and more goods and services. Presumably in a shrinking economy, you need less and less money to chase fewer and fewer goods and services. So burn. So, or, yeah, but it's just electrons anyway, so we can just delete it. Uh. <laughs> Federal taxes destroy bank money, base money, every time. It's essentially burnt. And base money is not preserved. It's, it's a fractional of what is perceived to be the fractional. Okay, but one of the, one of my favorite, my only favorite topic is an energy tax. <laughs> and yes, it is in there to, to suppress demand for energy, but also I would like to use proceeds for some good stuff. Yeah. I'd like to spend it somewhere else than for gasoline. Yeah. Uh, that's what and that's, actually, I believe we have so many problems that need addressing that what I think taxes should do is shift money from the private sector to the public sector, shift from expenditures on private goods, market goods, to expenditures on public goods. And so when we have plenty of public good problems that need solving, no shortage. And I, you know, John's actually, I'm learning, I'm, John wrote me, a, wrote a thesis that he submitted to me that was well beyond my knowledge. And as I'm reading his thesis, I'm actually learning more. So John, um, I didn't know, I learned a lot of these ideas looking at local, um, local currencies. And then it turns out, John's actually exposed me to that. There's actually theories behind all that. But the, the theories, like I say, understanding local currencies makes some of those theories really obvious. Because I understood them before I knew there was a theory. Endogenous money. In other words, look it up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you had uh, had restoration of natural capital up there. I mean, that seems like it could be another opportunity to take some of that money out of that, that system and then reinvest it back into what the original source of wealth That's the idea, and I also believe, though, that we've got another way to restore natural capital is to reduce our demands on it, and that means it yeah, taking taking money out of the hands of the private sector and the businesses that are transforming that natural capital into cheap plastic crap we don't need. Um, if I understood correctly, all this is like for domestic economy, like for U.S. and it's at national level. And I would like to ask you, uh, what will be the impact from international financial markets? Because I've been reading about like China, that is like growing a lot, and it's buying a lot of uh, U.S. Treasury securities. And right now, is is that is viewed as a threat for the, for the U.S. economy? So how could you like also control that? That is goes I, beyond. I don't. Um, look, I really don't understand. Uh, the full implications of all of this. What I do think about, though, is what happens if China decides it want, doesn't want to hold, you know, two point seven trillion dollars in U.S. Treasury bonds or U.S. dollars, and it decides to sell it. Will suddenly have a huge increase in the supply of dollars, which will lead to a huge decrease in the price. Or if uh, oil economies decide they're not going to, um, you know, trade in dollars, there'll be that many fewer goods and services being chased by dollars. So we could get like kind of a runaway hyperinflation. Um, and that can be insanely destabilizing. So one thing I think we actually have to plan for is, um, I lived in Brazil when they had hyperinflation and they issued a second currency, the real, with no inflation. And so they had the, they had the uh, Novos Cruzeiros with, uh, you know, almost 50% a month inflation and the real with zero inflation at the same time. And I actually believe if we had some kind of financial collapse, we would have to be prepared to issue potentially a new currency, greenbacks, saying you have to pay 50% of your taxes in greenbacks. And this will be, an, and you can make it so it will be an inflation-free currency, which means you have to be very careful, not increasing the supply above demand. And, um, and it, it, it'll, it, so this would be a response to, uh, you know, events beyond our control where you get people selling the dollar and then you get this expectation that the dollar will crash and you get this uh, speculative sell-off that crashes our economy, which happens pretty regularly around the world. I mean, I've been in Brazil also where there are, Currency crashed 66 percent because of the speculative sell-off when Lulu is going to be elected. So, um, so I've thought in terms of how would we address that issue, where suddenly our money becomes worthless, and I believe that you know creating a parallel currency might work. But the idea of you know we could also just print tons of money and pay off um, everybody and then print a parallel currency, but then we'd be screwing over China 
and all these other people. So I ethically could be very in favor of that. But it's a good question. I don't know enough. Maybe I don't know if John has any. I have to respond to that. Yeah, right here. Um, if the government can, if you have public credit money and the government prints money, then you don't have to borrow money anymore. Right. So you don't have to borrow any money from China anymore. Yeah. That yeah. The U.S. has to fund itself by borrowing money and pay interest. Yeah, right? that's a great you answer. Would get rid of, to the, you would get You wouldn't have to borrow any money from China if the government could print money. They buy treasury bonds. They buy treasury bonds. That's a borrow. That's, that's a borrow. That's because borrow. we import. That's because we give them dollars. So okay, we well, don't nevertheless, fund our debt. We borrow. We, you right. know, they, they buy our treasury. You wouldn't exactly. need to sell treasury bonds, you know, to anybody in order to finance the government, and you wouldn't need to pay interest on any of that because it would be public credit money that has no interest. Okay. So all of that international sovereign debt would disappear. Okay. Well, would you? You, you well, wouldn't. Have you wouldn't have created it the, to begin with. Well, you could. You'd have, yeah, you yeah. wouldn't have any more created. Yeah, yeah. We wouldn't create more. We have to figure out how to deal with what we've got out there, and you could easily deal with that through inflation, but that doesn't seem too fair. Right. Um, so when I hear you say, a, you know, aligning monetary policy with fiscal policy and kind of, you know, just using fiscal policy in, in essence to steer the economy, I, I immediately think about the eurozone. Right? I think about the experience of all of these countries sort of, you know, taking away their monetary policy tool, and yet what happened is because of, of politics and because of just this addiction to growth. They embolden each of these countries to use fiscal policy to get us into the same kinds of messes that you can get in with monetary policy, right? Yeah. Yeah. Big bloated government, big over The big difference is that's a big danger if your goal is growth. It's not such a big danger if your goal is, uh, you know, a contraction and uh, redistribution from private to public sector. So the, the idea is, you know, if you want to contract the economy, then you actually want to slow down growth in the private sector. Um, so I think that's a big part of it, but so also the preamble to all of this then is sort of changing your goal. Yeah, changing the goal, but also even if you didn't have that, what I actually favor is a lot of these ideas about uh, you know spending money into existence. You know, right now Burlington wants to invest in something; they've got to take out, they've got to you know sell municipal bonds, or if the state wants to do something, they got to sell Vermont state bonds. And um, I'm a I'm a big proponent of having interest-free, immediately redeemable bonds that can be used to pay taxes that come in one fives, tens, twenties, fifties, and hundreds. And it would be a perfectly legal local currency. You call it a bond, it's a Burlington bond. But so the government, when it's gonna hire contractors to do something, they say rather than taking out, you know, a big bond, they're saying we're gonna pay twenty percent of our contracts in bonds or whatever it is, which is gonna put a big premium on hiring local and keeping your and I, what I like about the local economies part is we see all the um, all the harm we do from our consumption, um, but it keep it gives essentially a, a, a stronger fiscal policy of the same sort, monetary fiscal policy at the local and the state level, and because um, that's what ultimately killed Burlington Bread was the Burlington Bread was pooling in pockets of private hands. It tried like hell to get um, get it to be allowed that you pay part of your utility bill. To yeah. Burlington Electric, municipally owned, with and that would have, then it would have pulled in public hands. Yeah, and, well, and the deal is, once you, because the idea is that the government spends the bonds into existence, gets it back in taxes. It's like spending your taxes before you collect them. Yeah. And so then you can look at this spending and destroying, because um, if your if your goal, you know, a lot of people have written about these ideas, always with the goal of stimulating economic growth. All the stuff about local currencies. How do we stimulate economic growth? And so when you flip it around, and suddenly you're trying to um, not only reduce economic growth, but shift it from growth of private consumption to growth of public goods, including you know natural capital and all that. Um, it's a, and I, you know I don't I don't know enough. Um, I, I love Herman's quote that uh, people who think they understand money probably haven't studied it enough. Um, and uh, and I, I totally so so I definitely would be an adaptive management type approach to all this. Um, well, I think the banks have already shown they just screwed it all up. Yeah, this doesn't necessarily have to be directed at you, but other than like a large collapse and then having to like rebuild the system, where do we need to go? What is like the first step to move along so we don't end up in collapse and then having them try to re rebuild? And, well, I, I think the first step, and we have the, we take this right now because we have this opportunity. As soon as the banks stop loaning as much money as they're legally allowed to, change the legal requirements so they can't loan so much. So we could have just. So we could have done that, there would have been no observable change, 
but it would have increased the leverage when the economy comes back. It means that the government now, so if you need a certain pool of money out there, and a lot of it's being loaned into existence by banks, you decrease their ability to do so, that increases the ability of the government to loan that money into existence, or spend that money into existence on critical things we need. And so I think you, you could start going gradually and just gradually move up fractional reserve until uh, the banks have really lost that ability. Um, I mean, you know, obviously it's, uh, um, you know, there was, uh, um, you know, more and more, you know, stock headlines in the paper yesterday that Europe, Europe can look at, you know, many, many years of no economic growth. And so I think that you have this unique opportunity where everybody is saying we need growth to be, um, you know, to thrive. And if suddenly we come up with policies that say, no, we don't need growth to thrive. In fact, contracting our economies would make us thrive more. Um, I think it is a window where if people can't have what they want, maybe they'll take what other people say is good. Uh, you had your hand up. I don't know your name. Do I? Uh, I'm Andrew. Andrew, all right. Mm -hmm. um, so kind of following that question, do you think it's possible that we would be able to kind of transition the economy before a major collapse happened? Or do you think the major collapse would have to happen for people to react and then think about, you know, realize that the, the previous economy didn't really work Which for the long term? kind of why I started out with that quote by Milton Friedman. Just um, Oh, doesn't matter. But, you know, but did, uh, you know, it says only a crisis actually perceived produces real change. Yeah. So, so there's two ways to think about this. One thing, um, you know, a crisis is coming, we've got to respond to that. Other thing is, you know, all of us are worried, how do we, you know, what are the leverage points? How do we affect change? How do we create change? Change is happening. Since we've been alive, you know, when I was a kid, the economy was all about buying and selling of real goods and services. Now, 95% 90, of financial flows or more are speculation. That is a dramatic, profound change in the structure of our economy, which actually is not, I don't register in economic theory. But so, I mean, the changes are there. The, so it's not a question of how do we make change, it's just a question of how do we direct change. So I think that, you know, we don't have to think about how do we change this whole static system. It's how do we, you know, uh, direct this really dynamic, continually changing system in the direction we want it to go. But I do think to get people to buy into a lot of our ideas probably will take some form of crisis. Mm -hmm. There's the fact to get them to buy into the, the idea that there are any ecological limits. You know, we're we're going backwards on that. Mm -hmm. I'd like to make a pitch for the for the group, the monetary yeah. group that we have on Monday at four, right? Yeah. yeah. And then there's a, a statewide that we're working on this got these ideas, and then there's a statewide group uh, that's going to uh, try to propose some of this, these things to the uh, executive branch of the government. <clears throat> and there's also efforts underway to create complementary currencies in Montpelier. Um, so there's a lot already happening. You can join the Public Banking Institute online, and they are talking about these issues online. Uh, you can get on their email list. Um, and in terms of, uh, in, to also answer your question more, there's already parallel currencies in a number of places. Yeah, um, <clears throat> you already mentioned Lincoln did it, and uh, uh, the colonists did it, and Pennsylvania did it, and Frank and uh, Andrew Jackson did it. <clears throat> Jefferson said, "If we ever let private banks issue our money, basically, we'll destroy the country." Yeah. Um, and it's also unconstitutional. It says in the Constitution says only Congress has the power to coin money, which banks interpret as, "Well, we're not printing coins." <laughs> yeah. right. So there's a lot of interest in this area. Um, and if you read, read Web of Debt by Ellen Brown, she's the head of the, the Public Banking Institute, and get involved in those issues. And the, the other countries, the island of Guernsey has a parallel currency, Bali has a parallel currency, Argentina created lots of parallel yeah, currencies thousands. when their uh, economy crashed. The U.S. did it in the, in the, in the um, Depression. So it's driven a lot of countries um, in the Depression. Swiss, Switzerland has a parallel currency. There's a statewide a mutual a bank, I'm sorry, uh, business to business mutual credit clearing system that's called the Sustainable Exchange as part of the BBSR, um, BBSR, right? Uh, yeah, BBSR is, has a Sustainable Exchange system, but it's only business to business. Um, so there's a lot of things going on in this area, and there's, there's many opportunities to get involved. If you, you know, and you want a list of, of all these different things, just email myself or Josh. But as far as I know, all the literature on this is talking about how do we use these ideas to promote growth and increase our growth rates. So it seems that um, this 
the policies you're proposing would require a necessary buying into the idea that we need to track the economy. It needs to be smaller. It needs to be state to state. And but all of that, is, as we've talked about, is sort of based on people's values of what the economy should be. So, how, what do you think are some of the ways we can show people that this is better? Like, how do how do we realign those values where so, people aren't wanting the plastic stuff? Right. Well, so one thing, here. and I'm not, you know, there's, there's one thing that how much people want plastic stuff. I don't know if you believe that that's the, you know, six hundred billion dollars spent a year convincing us we're not more cheap plastic crap. If we really were insatiable, you wouldn't need to spend, you know, the GMP of Canada every year convincing us that we're true. Um, you know, we would just go up and buy the stuff. Um, and, uh, um, the, uh, and the other part of, wait, it was, I was going to say something else about, um, uh, and the other, you know, in terms of government goals for growth, 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 that starts basically in 1960, 1960 or so when the OECD met and said our goal is government growth and growth is measured by GDP. And I really do think there's a powerful argument to be made. I think what we do is, uh, you know, there's been all this stuff talking about the flaws of GDP. And, uh, you know, it's an uh, incomplete measure of benefits or welfare. I want to take the opposite tack and say it's actually a reasonably accurate measure of costs. And, you know, three simple examples of that. You know, when oil prices tripled between 2005 and 2008, supply increased by 3%. The contribution of oil to our GDP essentially, you know, I mean, skyrocketed, and yet is re but no increase in value. We're not getting any more benefits. We didn't have more oil. Um, food prices, 2007 grain prices tripled due to a small decrease in supply. So GDP measured this huge, uh, you know, this huge increase of food to GDP is a result of a decrease in supply. Absolutely perverse. So anything that's essential and has no substitutes exhibits that behavior that a small decrease in output leads to a huge increase in price. So price times quantity or GDP will go up in response to us consuming less. So just making that case that it's a really stupid system. Another argument I like to use is just our healthcare system. If we're GDP is the goal, we spend 17% of our health care uh, of our government expenditure on healthcare, increased by 9% last year. That's the best thing possible. It's the growth sector for economy. What could be better? And, you know, if, you, if we spend as much as the OECD average, the difference would be equal to our national deficit, our government deficit. And, but anybody would say you're an idiot if you say you should try to maximize expenditure on health care. You should try to minimize that for the services you get. And that's how we should measure well-being. We should try to minimize GDP for the benefits we get. Um, and I think you had your hand first. Yeah, build a, building on this, what you started out by saying was that we need to change our goals. Yeah. And so how do we do that? Most of our goals have been, and with GDP, have been materialist goals, stuff. And if we can start to shift our goals to immaterial things, like the time that we spend with family and friends, the health, the quality environment we can enjoy, lots of things, that you can have as much of that as you want. And what does that? Well, changing our, what we measure changes where we're going. Yeah. So the movement for GPI and GNH and, and different ways of measuring is actually that lever that enables us to move people from wanting material things only to starting to want some immaterial things and finding that real value, real happiness, is uh, like that bumper sticker. Um, the best things in life are things. So there, there's a tool to want to learn. Well, let me be... Um my usual devil's advocate. Um, one way to take care of the problem you're talking about, uh, Tom, is to use drone strikes to kill all the inquisitive people and just leave the rest of us because we're steady staters all the way. We don't look forward to going to a meeting in San Francisco or vacation in Northern Canada or maybe a uh, research trip to Central America. Uh, just kill all the rest of them. But let me also ask not such a flip question. Uh, it's behind it. The distribution thing is is my, in my mind, absolutely crucial. And when we hear call for growth now, it's to put people to work because there's no other way to do that that doesn't involve redistribution, which nobody wants to touch. Uh, so I could say also, uh, Josh, I didn't hear the word jobs in your presentation. But actually, I want to ask a question of the group. You didn't hear unemployment, misery, and poverty. And public goods. And public goods. Infrastructure. Okay. But I want to ask a question of the young folks here. My, behind this is a hypothesis, everybody wants growth at some time in their life. 
typically when they're young, when they're unemployed and they haven't settled down to a comfortable life in a paradise like Burlington. Mm -hmm. So who here wants no economic growth right now? What does that mean? Per personally, personally or it's different it's like nationally or personally? Well, nationally. Because, yeah, nationally. Or let me put it in a different way. Is there anybody here who wants work? Well, it's, it, it's a tricky question because it's not whether you want it or not, it's whether you think it's sustainable or not. So, you know, if you if you if you tell me Those are different questions. Can, can, you know, can we grow forever? Oh yay. I'll, so I'll go in that train. Another phrase way to phrase it. Let's say we could grow forever. No limits whatsoever. So currently, you know, we're doubling our levels of consumption every generation. Do you think your kids will be better off consuming twice as much as you, your grandkids four times as much as you? You know, I mean, is that exactly. what? And I, I actually think that probably um, my kids will be better off consuming half as much stuff and spending twice as much time playing with, you know, friends in the street. Well, okay. I, I, I won't. Can't you can see how before, but you can see with growth and income earning opportunities not being synonymous with growth and um, well, unsustainable rates of consumption and well, think this way. You want to be a college professor. What's that? You want to be a college professor. I definitely don't. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, no growth in, in the college population, steady state population. No growth in the number of jobs at the university because it's not growing. So basically, you wait until somebody dies. Um, you want tenure, and you can't get it. You want growth until you get ten tenure, and then. Well, I'm guessing that one reason John doesn't want to be a college professor is he doesn't want to work 60 hours a week. Mm -hmm. So if we work 30 hours a week, right, then we can twice that's, that's a segue. No, <laughs> so, so the question is about, so the point is, um, your question points to? If, if everybody wants growth at some time in their lives, and you put it all together, where are the folks who don't want growth? But I don't think, to be honest, I don't think anybody wants growth. I think people want other things that they think growth will help them achieve. It's like you're talking about jobs. Yeah, and you know, we doubled our economy since 1969, and we have more unemployment, we have more people in poverty, um, even by percentages. So there's very little signs that growth solves those problems anyway. And you know, we're told that growth will help us achieve these meaningful, more fulfilling lives. We want more fulfilling lives. And how many people would say, you know, how many people here think they could have taken another career that would have got them more money? And instead, took a job, <laughs> took a job that was less money for more fulfillment. Absolutely. And, uh, <laughs> and I would guess that almost anybody wants the fulfillment, not the money. We don't want the growth. And if we dedicated our economy instead of like maximizing our incomes, we'd be consumed to maximizing the quality of life from our jobs, the fulfillment of our work. It's personal growth rather than economic. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But, but it's oops, sorry. Go ahead. So I think one of the issues here is. Um, was mentioned, I didn't actually get a chance to read the whole paper, but in the first paragraph it mentioned population. And I think that this is maybe one of the issues here, because if the population was steady state population, then presumably yeah. there would be a certain amount of turnover where people coming into the jobs would be coming in at the same time that people are retiring from the jobs. And so, I mean, and I don't really know that much about this, but this is just my first reaction, that therefore your personal um, growth opportunities would not be linked to the whole entire economic growth and the amount of resources extracted and such. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, and your argument, too, about going back to me, the, the thing is, you're talking about professors' jobs, that has to do with population growth. We could decide that we're going to redistribute money from the private sector to the public sector and that education makes us better off in some ways, and therefore we could double the population people going to college, because we decide that's a public good. All right, but that's also unfair. That's saying you've got a state state economy regarding your job or the thing you want to do, we're growing. Or, well, it's because something else is shrinking. If what I sure don't there. want is growing workload. I want a diminishing workload. All right, it's also that's public investment. A diminishing too. Money I mean, that. training and, and education is all public investment that's been sort of marginalized. Okay, but that's still saying is the equity question, which you always ask, even in a growing economy, should we put more money into education or less money into road maintenance? Yeah. Or I believe we should put less money into those folks who make $5 billion a year. Mm -hmm. you know, we should, uh, okay, I think we should. So huge equity. But anyway. But it, I, did, I did mean to stress equity on the poverty side, too, obviously the jobs. Well, yeah. Everybody we'll always, always fixates on jobs as the only source of uh, income. Right. How about non-wage income? In order to have a steady state economy, people have to work less. 
which means they have to have some other source of money. Um, and you can also use monetary policy to pay everybody just on a basic income. But actually, I, that whole thing about working less, I kind of, I don't believe, because I believe if we reduce our use of fossil fuels by 80, 90%, and you have 25,000 hours of labor in a barrel of oil, well, if we're not getting those 20, you know, if we're not getting 350 hours of energy slaves per day, we're doing more work. You know, um, you know, we're going to grow more of our own food in our garden. We're going to, if you call it work, we're going to be riding our bikes more to, to work. We're going to be, you know, sewing our own clothes, stuff like that more. And not, you know, maybe killing our own animals to sew the sew them from. That won't necessarily be jobs. That you are, you know, no, but it's, it's but it's work. It's labor, but it's, it's not labor. necessarily a job. That, <laughs> It has to be another source of income other than your job, otherwise. Well, that's all sorts of income, though. Otherwise, you, yeah, have, to, you mm -hmm. have to have, um, you have to work more. <coughs> but, but like, you know, it's like my garden. Get you life. clothes and get you food. And, yeah, yeah. I mean, get you transportation. Well, if you do it all so yourself, why would you need that's that? a different story. Yeah. Yeah. Because so, we're not going to do it with fossil fuels. Well, but you might not be doing it all yourself. It might be that it's more of a shifting of jobs from, like, for example, the financial sector, which isn't actually producing manufactured goods right now, but it's just, you know, especially creating wealth for a few, and some of those jobs would be reallocated to actual production of goods and services that people consume. But that goes back to the question of values, too, and, and do people value that type of work? Is it seen as a kind of job that is, you know, when you want? Well, people in the United States or, or you know, in developed countries would say, oh, that type of thing is abuse, because we're not getting compensated for work as you know, that's something that happens in the developing wor uh, world all the time. You know, you work, you have to do a lot of work and you probably get paid for just a little bit, you know. But so the, the change in values has to be tremendous for something like this. But it also, you know, the, the circumstances would change the values, as you said. You know, people just going to have to adapt. I, I think that, you know, the message, you know, we've decided that the major form of communication, all media, is going to be driven for profit which means everything we see, every, even newspapers, everything, it's got to be able to sell this idea that you will consume more, otherwise it can't pay for itself. And if they're going to be effective at it, they've got to be fundamentally changing our values to believe that, this, that we are insatiable, that we need that vacation in northern Canada, or we need this other, you know, that we're not satisfied being here, we need more crap. The one thing, I think that we, there's a difference between growth and development. And I think that there is a way for companies to potentially develop within a market without affecting overall growth. So if there's a way to be able to tease those two things out, I think we might have a better way of communicating with the business and um, personal consumer dynamics. Yeah, I mean, as a communicate these ideas to get them. I think part of it also is, um, I was in a class uh, a few years ago and we were asked whether we can really change our lifestyle. I think we need to start looking at, uh, we used to buy things just because we needed them, now this whole consumerism. So there's many, many different aspects that play into it. But one thing I read recently, because there's a, a lot of people are throwing around the term um, green jobs, um, and I don't really see that next step. A lot of people are talking about a green economy. Well, what does that really mean? We really want it. But um, this one book I was looking at said that um, until the economic drivers are in place for that economy, so you have these variables about if the economic drivers are stronger than the ones now. So you're talking about lifestyle, consumerism. You know, the C word, nobody wants to talk about capitalism, distribution of wealth, so everyone has to skirt around that. But these are all things that factor in. And I was optimistic at the time, saying, oh, our paradigm was changing, we'd be able to change our lifestyle. But that was five years ago, and nothing happened, so I even wondered why I said that. I think in the end, it's going to have to happen a lot of education, outreach. It's not going to happen overnight, but I think it can happen because. <coughs> I think people really are open to the idea. The idea of the environment is kind of warm and fuzzy. And so we have people, the citizens, at a point where they are interested. They are buying more into the whole climate. So there has to be this nexus between somehow making the bridge to that next economy. I mean, I guess that what I see happening is that uh, 
I don't, you know, they talk about Europe stagnating for many years, and the U.S., I don't believe we're going to get back to growth like we say we need. So the rate of growth we need to reduce unemployment is huge. We're not going to get it. Europe's not going to get it. So we can have these people saying we absolutely need this in order to have meaningful lives and get rid of unemployment, but we can't have it, and it's not happening. And suddenly, people are going to pay a lot more attention to those say, guess what, guys, we don't need it. We can create jobs for all those people. We can get rid of that misery and that poverty. We can have fulfilling lives without that growth, which you, growth, which you can't have anyway, which certainly makes people more willing to listen to an alternative view. Um, you know, it's like, uh, it's like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I can tell you, but. <laughs>